Hello, everyone. My team and I are here to present a feasibility analysis on our design using nanofiltration technology for microcystin removal in the drinking water of Auburn, New York. My name is Paul DeVries, and my teammates, Mallory Delanoy and Cameron Daly, are from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And we are here representing the New York Water Environment Association. Here's a brief overview of what we will discuss today, including introduction to the problem and its analysis, followed by presentation of possible and recommended solutions. Cameron will begin by introducing the project. Thank you, Paul. Our project focuses on the water filtration plant owned by the city of Auburn in New York. The plant began operations in 1918 with some of its original equipment still in use today. The plant draws its water from Owasco Lake, one of the Finger Lakes. This photograph shows the north end of Owasco Lake where the plant's pump station is located here. The water filtration plant is located north. Overall, the plant produces 3.8 million gallons per day, serving a total of 43,000 people. Like many other Finger Lakes, Owasco has seen harmful algal blooms in recent history. These harmful algal blooms produce cyanotoxins, which are harmful to humans. One of these toxins is microcystin and was detected in the city's finished water in 2016. The city responded quickly to get a powder activated carbon system in place. This entailed injecting activated carbon at the plant's intake point so that while on the water's journey to the treatment plant, the carbon could absorb the microcystin and it could later be removed by the plant's treatment processes. Although the current powdered activated carbon process is effective, the city is looking for a more long-term approach to this problem as the plant was not originally designed to handle the extra sludge volume produced. This approach also requires a constant purchase of powder activated carbon and results in an increase in waste sludge byproducts entering the waste lagoon. Now I'll delve into the current plant operations, focusing on operations during the HAB season. Before being upgraded in 2002, the plant consisted of two slow sand filters and a clarifier. In 2002, the city upgraded the plant by adding a coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation process. They also added three rapid sand filters and converted the old clarifier into a chemical storage building. Upon intake, water is conveyed to the plant via a 36 inch pipe. The powdered activated carbon is injected into the intake pipe to provide contact time for the microcystin to absorb to the powdered carbon as the water is conveyed to the plant. Next, water enters a rapid mixing tank where it mixes with a polyaluminum chloride for coagulation, then heads into, co into the coagulation basin. After the flocks form and fall out of the solution, the next step is sedimentation. Water then moves slowly through a baffled chamber and suspended particles further settle out of the water. The water then passes through a rapid sand filter and is disinfected with sodium hypochlorite before distribution. This is the broad strokes flow of operations at the wa Auburn Water Treatment Plant. Given a little background on the project, we established objectives and constraints to help best address the problem and generate the optimal solution. The objectives include reducing the cost of the project, minimalizing the manual labor required to clean the system, and reducing the waste stream that is managed on site. The project constraints apply specifically to the design during the operational period or the HAB season, typically from July to November. These constraints require that the design is able to reduce microcystin below health advisory levels of 0.3 micrograms per liter. The design also must be able to supply the plant's current peak flow of 5 MGD, meet the Department of Health standards and saturation requirements, as well as maintain hardness in order to prevent damage to the pipes. Finally, the design must be able to fit within the current space available on site. So in terms of the final constraint, 
the project design should be placed on the existing plant property in the area initially set aside for future plant installations and improvements. This area, as seen box in red, is the proposed design location and is approximately 2,500 square feet. Now, Mallory will discuss the general design approach. Thank you, Cameron. So we designed a system using nanofiltration technology to address the problem. But in general, what is nanofiltration? So it's a membrane-based filtration method to treat drinking water using membranes with nanometer-sized pores. The approximate molecular weights that nanofiltration membranes employ are around 200 to 1,000 Daltons. Microcystin is around 995 Daltons, but it is general practice to design for a pore size that is about half that in order to account for any geometric irregularities. Therefore, even designing a membrane with a pore size of 500 Daltons or less, nanofiltration is still capable of removing microcystin, as well as suspended solids, bacteria, viruses, and multivalent ions, while it lets water and monovalent ions pass through. Overall, the molecular weight differences between the feedwater components and the membrane material structure dictates what passes through the membrane and what is effectively filtered out. A nanofiltration membrane design is referred to as a skid, which can then be further broken down even to a single element. The skid, as boxed in green, consists of a set of stages, sized for the required design flow, or 5 MGD. Each stage is then made up of a group of pressure vessels, which are typically arranged in multiples of 4, 2, 1, to make up three successive stages. Each pressure vessel consists of a group of elements, typically six to eight. Each element is then made up of a membrane material arranged in a desired configuration. The membrane material and element configuration require specific decision criteria to be considered in order to select the best options for this project. So the membrane material was selected by evaluating each of the possible solutions, considering the specific design criteria indicated in the first column of the design matrix. Overall, each criteria was weighted based on how relevant it was to the project's objectives and importance to the design. Within the design matrix, three represents the most optimal choice, while a score of one represents the least optimal choice or lowest ranked option. The possible solutions include cellulose acetate, polyamide thin film composite membranes, and ceramic membranes. And based on the design criteria, the polyamide membrane is the optimal membrane choice as it had average costs and maintenance compared to the other options. In addition to this, when researching the availability of products, it was found that cellulose acetate membranes are outdated and not as commonly used, and ceramic membrane products are not as readily available. So after selecting the membrane material, we consider the element configuration next. The design criteria are again indicated in the first column of the design matrix, and similar to the material design matrix, each criteria was weighted and a higher value represents a more optimal choice. The possible solutions for element configurations include spiral wound, hollow fine fiber, tubular, and plate and frame configuration. After evaluating the advantages and disadvantages of each with respect to our design criteria, the spiral wound configuration is the optimal choice. And although it requires more maintenance, it has the lowest costs and is the most space efficient configuration. With the help of David Silverman, a PE at PSI Process, and Sean Carter at Torre Membranes, we were also able to evaluate our alternatives using membrane projection software results. So we were able to confirm our recommended membrane design thanks to the help of manufacturer contacts who ran the software for nanofiltration process design to project the optimal membrane and its specifications given our project's site-specific operating parameters and feed water quality. Based on these projections, the recommended membrane material is polyamide thin film composite, and element configuration is spiral wound. The recommended product produced a permeate flow rate of 7,500 gallons per day per membrane. So based on the proje membrane projections and the AWWA design manual M46, our design will include six membrane elements per pressure vessel and three stages per skid. In the first stage, there will be 32 vessels with a 55% recovery. In the second stage, there will be 16 pressure vessels with a 48% recovery. Finally, the third stage will have eight vessels with a recovery ratio of 33%. These three stages make up one skid, filtering the concentrate through the successive stages 
and passing a total permeate of 2 MGD through. Overall, the design will require four skids total. Three skids are needed to meet the design flow of 5 MGD, and an additional skid is needed for redundancy. This design has an overall recovery ratio of 85%. The general arrangement drawing for the skid design was provided by Samantha Kendrick, a PE at H2O Innovations, in order to depict general membrane system sizing. The approximate membrane dimensions are included. Each skid is about 490 square feet, so the total four skids will require about 2,000 square feet, and a building will be constructed to house the four skids in the allotted space on site. Now Paul will discuss the additional design aspects. Thank you, Mallory. To successfully incorporate nanofiltration, the proper pre and post treatment is necessary. The right pretreatment will remove particulates to reduce turbidity to a target of 0.3 NTUs and prevent biofouling. Proper pH adjustment is also necessary to prevent scaling of the membranes. After nanofiltration, post treatment is necessary to disinfect and stabilize water. Disinfection is something all municipal water must go through, so Auburn already has a system in place. So we focused on stabilization, which is the process of making water less corrosive. Nanofiltration removes a lot of important ions like calcium and bicarbonate, and this reduces the hardness, the alkalinity, and the pH, making the stream corrosive. Finally, we considered waste stream management. One common strategy is sewer discharge, this requires no new permits and minimal equipment would be required, so the waste stream will be sent to the Auburn Wastewater Treatment Plant. Now, the pretreatment incorporates a lot of pre-existing elements. Raw water is drawn from Wasco Lake and it goes through coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation before going through the rapid sand filters and then to the underground clear well. Normally, it, it would go straight to disinfection and eventual distribution. However, we're going to make a seasonal bypass using a vertical turbine pump to the nanofiltration skids. The water will undergo a little pH adjustment to prevent scaling in the membranes. We plan on sending the waste stream to the sewer and running the permeate through calcite contactors to restore hardness and alkalinity. Adding carbon dioxide to the stream will help aid the dissolution of the calcite in water to add calcium and bicarbonate ions. A final pH adjustment may be necessary to further stabilize the stream. After consulting with several manufacturers and discussing quotes, we established the final cost breakdown as detailed in the tables for capital costs and annual operations and maintenance costs. Total costs for materials is $5.6 million, and with an added 20% contingency, it totals to around $6.7 million. The annual operation and maintenance costs are about 5% of the total, adding up to be $335,000. The equivalent uniform annual cost for the proposed nanofiltration design is approximately $600,000. This is much more expensive than the do-nothing alternative, which has a total equivalent uniform annual cost of $19,000. Although the design has a greater equivalent uniform annual cost than the do-nothing alternative, it provides a unique opportunity for the city of Auburn to not only reduce the waste managed on site and eliminate the need for powder activated carbon, but also become a model municipality in terms of using membrane technology to address emerging issues in surface drinking water supply. And now I'm going to hand it over to Cameron. Thank you, Paul. In conclusion, we found our nanofiltration design to be a viable alternative for the removal of microcystin from the city of Auburn's drinking water supply. Should the city choose to pursue this option, we would recommend that their next step be to collect additional operational data and run a pilot plant to confirm our assumptions before moving to a larger implementation. The pilot should be a small scale NF skid that draws its input from the rapid sand filter clear wells. The pilot will be run over an entire HAB season in order to take samples to monitor the performance. Initial samples would be taken from the NF influence stream 
to determine if additional pretreatment would be required. Then, from the skid, we would sample the permeate stream to ensure expected effluent values and our selected post-treatment process is sufficient. Samples of the concentrate stream would be taken to ensure once the design is scaled up, we won't exceed the wastewater treatment plant's permit. Finally, we would also collect operational data to project chemical cleaning requirements. We hope you've enjoyed our presentation, and now we would like to give you some thanks to those who helped make this project a success. Thank you to our clients for giving us this opportunity, as well as educating us on their profession. Thank you to our ESF faculty and additional group members, Joshua Crane and John Perez, for helping us to successfully complete this project. And thank you to the vendors and manufacturers who elevated our understanding and level of design to new heights. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Thank you.